Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. If the normal political rules applied to Donald Trump, he would be holed up in the White House in a state of despair. He's at war with Democrats in Congress. The federal government is partially shut down. His relationship with Putin's Russia is under fierce scrutiny. And his standing at home and abroad continues to take a hit. And yet, every day, he comes out punching, raising the stakes, not retreating. My guest is Mika Mosbacher, Republican strategist and member of the National Advisory Board of Trump 2020. Is the Trump presidency making America great or greatly diminished? Mika Mosbacher in Washington, D.C., a very warm welcome to Hard Talk. Good morning. <laughs> you have been a long time and a loyal supporter of President Trump, but would you accept that his presidency has now entered a very dangerous phase, given that the Democrats now control the House of Representatives and are using their new power? I wouldn't call it dangerous. I think that we expected to have this issue with the hardline Democrats, especially with the leadership. Uh, and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer have obviously dug in. And in this hypercharged environment, I would say that passing bipartisan legislation, including border security, will be as tough as putting socks on a rooster. However, Trump will not back down, his base is sticking with him, and after all, I think we're beginning to see some cracks in the Democratic Party. There were 15 Democrats, including 10 freshmen, that did not support Nancy Pelosi for speaker. Additionally, the hypocrisy is very rich. Uh, President Obama said in 2014 that we had a humanitarian crisis at the border and it was time to drop politics. All right, well, we can talk border security and the strength of the yeah. case that Donald Trump has made for the need for the wall in a minute, but let's start by talking political process because, in essence, yes. what Donald Trump is doing right now is an act of outrageous political vanity, isn't it? He's holding the U.S government, the federal machine, hostage. He's blackmailing the nation, saying, unless you give me what I want on this wall, I am going to ensure the government can't function. It's blackmail. No, it's not. First of all, the Dems also own this shutdown because President Trump is willing to negotiate a deal, and that could include a pathway for the 1.8 million dreamers in the United States. And that's something that the Democrats have wanted for some time. So there could be a win-win on both sides, and both sides could save face. The problem is, is that the leadership won't come to the table. They won't bring an alternate proposal. They have walked away like childish children. So well, I think, I, I, again, sorry, that both but, but, sides... But, have but, a part in this. But, I mean, the vice president, Mike Pence, put it as baldly as anybody. He basically said, there's no wall, there's no deal. And that, frankly, in, the new, in the new regime in Washington with a Democratic-controlled house is just a recipe for continued gridlock. And the reality is that 800,000 federal workers do not get paid. Yes. Key government functions, including airport security, FBI, uh, prison guards, these sorts of people are not getting paid. This is an outrageous, irresponsible way to run the government as president. And Donald Trump, according to the American public's opinion polling evidence, is not getting away with it. Well, I always look at polling with, and, and don't believe necessarily all the polls. I did see the ABC WAPO poll. But, but actually, the numbers are beginning to drift more and more in favor of President Trump. Now, let's go back and look at the fact that we have 
freshman Dems who some have already said, such as Congressman Hill out of California, that they are willing to support some sort of barricade at the border. I think the Democrats will feel the heat as well, especially from unions. Well, I feel for the federal workers because they do live paycheck to paycheck, and this is an issue. Yeah, it's sure even it is. more reason for the Democrats to come to the table. Now, you, I want to bring up Newt Gingrich because I think that you might have been, uh, I don't know if you were in Washington then, but there was a shut, uh, a government shutdown in 1995 when Newt Gingrich was speaker. I, I remember. And he said it was very, remember, it was very painful at the time, but out of it came some of the best legislation, including a comprehensive welfare plan. He feels, as I do, that there are some Democrats well, who realize that this could hurt them going forward in their reelections well, in 2020. Maybe you're right, yes. but maybe maybe there are lots of reasons why Republicans might worry, and maybe people like you who've been staunch supporters of Trump might worry too, not least. Donald Trump, again, is mm -hmm. telling untruths. He said the other day, uh, he, this is a quote from him, when I said Mexico would pay for the wall in front of thousands of people, obviously I never meant Mexico would write a check. That's what he said the other day. The truth is, during the 2016 campaign, when you were a loyal supporter of his, he specifically outlined, and I'm going to quote now, he outlined how he planned to, quote, yes. compel Mexico to make a one-time payment of 5 to $10 billion. So President Trump is lying to the American people. He's now putting a bill before the American people for over $5 billion, which he promised, as a candidate, would be paid by the Mexican government direct. So, of course, Donald Trump is being blamed by the U.S. public. Well, being blamed by which public, I would argue, his base is sticking to him, according to our internal polling. Remember, our campaign has been up and running since uh, January 2017, which is kind of unprecedented for uh, an incoming president. But in, in regard to Mexico paying for the, law, for the wall, I'm not so sure people really took that literally. If you look at quotes in President uh, Trump's book, Art of the Deal, he said people want to believe something that is biggest and greatest, and I call it truthful hyperbole. Yeah, so he Mika, uses exaggeration Mika, Mika. like a salesman. I don't think that that is what people are really concerned about. What they reacted to was his strength and the fact that well, he said he would build a wall. You're dangerously, I believe that you're that dangerously, wall will be built. Well, you're dangerously close to suggesting that the truth doesn't really matter. Surely it really does matter a great deal, particularly in this issue. Donald Trump, again, to move on from the costing of the wall, Donald Trump said, I have the right to declare a national emergency. And he went on primetime TV to tell the American people there was a security yeah. Uh, crisis a national emergency the truth is there is no national emergency the DEA the Drug Enforcement Agency uh, confirms that the vast mm -hmm. majority of drugs entering the US uh, from Mexico come through official border crossings they do not come from illegals crossing any sort of border illegally uh, if you look again at the at the evidence of terrorist groups which Donald Trump says are sending operatives again illegally into the US from Mexico there is not one known case of a terrorist entering US territory from Mexico these are more Donald Trump untruths no I mean we could spend all day long if you want to go down the rabbit hole of how many politicians flip-flop so I think that that is uh, politics as usual however I am from Texas, and I completely disagree. This is a national border, national security crisis, as well as a humanitarian crisis. Yes, people uh, in tw 2016, yes, there were slightly fewer crossings, but it spiked again at the end of 2018. And what we've seen are 60,000 people coming across the border a month. These are CB uh, 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 Border Patrol statistics, not White House statistics. With, with respect, now, the, numbers, the, numbers, wait, wait. the numbers aren't even 60, half. 000. They're not even half what they were in the late 90s and early 2000s. So but how can what you... has changed, Stephen? What has changed, Stephen, is the composite of the illegal immigrants coming across. First of all, it used to be individual males. Now they are families, including unaccompanied children. And many make the perilous journey from El Salvador, for example, and Honduras, and, and some 
I don't know how many, but some are subjected to sexual assault and really terrible conditions. They made promises from the coyotes, is what we call the human smugglers coming into the United States. And what it has done is it strained our detention centers, it strained our medical supply services. We need more personnel across the border and Customs and Border Patrol agents, including Mark Morgan, who was Custom Border Patrol Chief under Obama stated that a wall works. In Texas alone, we have the Rio Grande yeah. River that yeah. is across the U.S. Mexico, Texas border. Well, it's a shallow river. I don't, there I, are no barricades. And I, so where those people are coming across is where there are no barricades. Where well, there are barricades in El Paso and Yuma, Arizona, 90% of the traffic has been stopped. Well, if we I don't build know. a wall, I, Mika, it's a one-time expense. I may, if I may interrupt for just a second, I, I don't know whether you supported the, the way in which the Trump administration uh, enforced the policy whereby more than two and a half thousand children were separated from their parents oh. a policy which in the end was challenged successfully in the courts I don't know whether you want to go back to that but I'm telling you a lot of Republican donors and you work closely with Republican donors are yes, very unhappy about the long-term consequences of what Donald Trump is doing in terms of the wall the shutdown everything else I'm gonna quote you one Dan Eberhardt a big donor supportive of uh. Trump in the past he said weaponizing a so-called national emergency to achieve a policy objective is usually something that happens in banana republics, not in George Washington's republic. You have got a problem here. Oh, that's one donor out of many. You know, the RNC raised over $260 million last election cycle. That's a record. I look at money coming in, and I look at the fact that the base is supporting him. Yes, there are dissenters, and I will say something about the, the families being separated from children, I found that extraordinarily distressing and, and certainly um, very disturbing. And so I, I haven't always agreed with everything in the Trump administration. I'm a volunteer, by the way. I'm not paid by the campaign, so I am very much an independent thinker. But I do feel that President Trump has the right instincts, especially since I'm from Texas and I've experienced it firsthand, the drug cartel situations, uh, drug cartels like Sonola controlling certain states in Mexico. Yes, the drugs are coming in from the port of entry, but I visited with Jamie Hunt, who's the former DEA chief out of New York City, and he said that these drugs are coming in on tractor trailers. They have very smart criminals who are putting in false walls. The dog sniffing dogs, All right, well, uh, the drug we, sniffing dogs we, can't, wait, may I finish? The drug sniffing dogs can't even sniff the drugs. So if we can have a wall, one time expense, we can reallocate the money to come up with better detection systems, more sensors, uh, drones that can thwart the All drones right. that are flying low, that are coming in by bad actors. We have a lot of, of, of work to do. The wall is not an end-all be-all, but right. it's an important first step. I want to I move on from, from the wall and the shutdown, because uh, there's lots else that it, it represents huge <laughs> challenges for, for you guys and the Trump administration. But before we finish, just one last question in brief, please. What is the way out of this? Donald Trump has suggested he could live with a shutdown for months, if not a year or more. No. That is not acceptable, is it? The way out is for Congress to do his job. And if I were President Trump, which I'm not, obviously, but I would suggest that he tell members of Congress not to go home, not to recess, not to go to Puerto Rico on a lobbying trip, as many Democrats did over the weekend. But stay in Washington, do your job, sit down and find bipartisan legislation. Both sides need to give in a bit. He will, as a last resort, declare in a national emergency, something I don't totally support. And I think that we need a legislative solution, and that's up to Congress, especially those facing re-election in 2020. Donald Trump's problems uh, are legion. And perhaps 
most pressing for him inside the White House when he's with his closest advisors and legal counsel is the sense in which the Mueller investigation is now closing in on him, his closest associates, and the White House. How did you react when you learned from the uh, newspapers this last week that the FBI oh. had launched an investigation into whether Trump wittingly or unwittingly had acted as an agent of Russia in 2017? I thought it was outrageous and, and Ken Starr, the prosecutor for Whitewater, said yesterday that it was amazing and that there should be an investigation into who leaked that from the DOJ or the FBI. The fact that they are calling Trump a Russian agent is preposterous. Uh, secondly, we do have we do have a small group in leadership that has been discredited in the FBI. Comey was fired. That was the president's constitutional right. We have Andrew McCabe who yeah, lied uh, to Congress on, on three the subject, times. On the subject of Comey, yes. do you think it's acceptable for Donald Trump to call James Comey with his distinguished record and career, quote, a dirty cop? Well, the, he certainly did not show best practices he when was, he was the FBI he was director. A he director went to the of press. The FBI. He had served the FBI loyally mm. for years. He had served different presidents in different jobs, always with outstanding success. And Donald Trump dismisses him as a dirty, mm. bad cop. Andrew Card had problems with um, uh, uh, Comey way back during uh, Bush 43. Uh, Comey has shown in the past uh, uh, almost a willingness to be above best practices. The fact that he went to the press, exonerated Hillary Clinton after interviewing her or having that interview during July 4th weekend, uh, a few days later, uh, there was the announcement that she'd been exonerated without a full investigation. The fact that Comey leaked through a professor at Columbia to the press is again not something that is normally yeah, but, acceptable but the within point is, the you, FBI. You, it, so I would say that he does have, the president well, had some issues with him. He lost faith in him and confidence in him, and it was his right to fire him. The president has his opinions. We all know he can be extremely abrasive at times and a counterpuncher, and what you see is what you get with President Trump. Well, I Trump. just wonder how current law enforcement agents of all levels feel about uh, Donald Trump railing against dirty cops. but. But in the meantime, you suggest to me that in the end, what is going on with the Mueller investigation is, is a prejudgment, and of course Donald Trump repeatedly calls it a hoax. The, exactly. fact is, uh, the fact is at least 33 people, three different companies, have been charged already as a result of the special mm -hmm. counsel investigation. And very soon now, it seems, we are going to get his report. How nervous are you? You're involved in Donald Trump 2020, trying to persuade the American public to give this guy a second term, and yet the net is closing in on him. I don't think so. They have not proved collusion in two years, and after spending $35 million. Now, William Barr's confirmation hearing is going on today, and uh, William Barr has indicated that he feels that Mueller should do his job without being interfered with. Mueller is a professional. I do respect him, so let him do his job. I feel that there will be absolutely no proof of collusion at the end of this investigation. And the other, uh, those Russians, for example, that were indicted, those that had to do with the uh, Internet Research Agency, the Troll Farm, et cetera, and some of the oligarchs indicted, well, that is somewhat outside the bounds of the original intent uh, in, in appointment of the special prosecutor. But I will say one thing that Americans do understand and has been acknowledged by the Trump administration is Russia did attempt to interfere in the election. There's absolutely no question. But that doesn't mean that there was collusion or a crime committed by the campaign. Strange, isn't it, that there has not been one time where Donald Trump has directly, directly criticized, condemned, taken on Vladimir Putin. He's called the EU a foe. He suggested, according to the New York Times' latest investigative reporting, that he wants the United States to leave NATO, and yet he has never directed his fire directly at Vladimir Putin. Do you ever wonder why? 
No, I mean, he's, he's entitled to his opinion. He has to work with these world leaders, but no one's been tougher on Russia than, than President Trump. He expelled 60 diplomats from, uh, Russian diplomats from the United States. He has in very tough sanctions, including those uh, put on Russia by the Treasury Department uh, in the end of 2018. He's certainly shown that he's been tough, so I say look yeah, at with, his actions. With, a lot with, of with, this with is respect, just his many of, many of the, many of the administration yeah. policies that have hurt Russia appear to have been driven by people not Donald Trump. For example, James Mattis, who, has, of course, has since quit the administration, saying that yeah. his views and strategic thinking is very much not aligned with the president. So I come back to this point. Never, ever has Donald Trump directed his personal criticism at Vladimir Putin. And I just wonder if you ever ask yourself why. No, I think he has to get along with world leaders, especially superpowers. But I do feel that, again, look at his actions, not what he says. He also sanctioned Russia after they used a nerve agent on a Russian agent in Great Britain. So again, look at it, look at his actions. That speaks volumes. Let's just end by talking about the Republican Party. It's very dear to you. You oh, and your late husband have yes. worked one way or another for the Republican Party for many years. Your late husband was a Commerce Secretary serving George H.W. Bush. We know George H.W. Bush had no time at all for Donald Trump. We know his son George W. Bush thought that Donald Trump wasn't qualified, didn't have the character to be president. And we know that other senior Republicans think that people, frankly, like you, are making a grave mistake tying yourself and the party to Donald Trump. I'll just quote one former speaker, John Boehner, says, right now there is no Republican Party, there is a Trump Party. And the Republican Party seems to be kind of taking a nap somewhere. Oh, Stephen, you know, I went through a lot of soul searching when I looked at the field of contenders for 2016. And I had started as a volunteer with President Bush 41, so I had loyalty there. But I had uh, begun to do some self-examination. I was a member of the so-called establishment, and I realized an establishment c candidate couldn't win. There was a uh, anger, a collective anger, that was boiling beneath the surface in this country. And there were individuals that were tired of establishment and, and politics as usual. And I began to look at who I thought could win. And I. I narrowed the field down to Ted Cruz, who was my senator from Texas, who I'd known for quite a while, and also Donald Trump. I felt that those two individuals were disruptors. They were not part of politics as usual. And, and, and I felt that to, to gain power again in the Republican Party, that we needed someone new and unorthodox. And we certainly got that with President Trump. To quote and, another, and again, a, a, another public servant who served a, a, a Republican president, George W. Bush, Elliot Cohen, he said, it is clear that under Donald Trump, uh, the United States is diminished in its standing. He says that those... Uh, forces around the world that are reshaping alliances, reconfiguring networks, they are bypassing the United States and diminishing its standing. Mm. You reap what you sow, and you're now reaping what you sowed with your support for Donald Trump. Yes, and I'm proud of it. You don't feel that this idea he's making great America great again is, frankly, the greatest untruth of all. No, he is making America great again. Look at his accomplishments, a roaring economy. Remember so many presidents or presidential candidates have lost. It's the economy, stupid. He's rolled back hundreds of regulations, job-killing regulations. We had a jobs report in December, 325K jobs. We have two Supreme Court justices now that are conservatives. We have... Re uh, put the embassy back in Jerusalem. His accomplishments, I could go on and on and on, and at the end of the day, Americans care about feeding their families, and that is putting America first. So while there are some never-Trumpers in the party, I understand that, and they're very dissenting voices, at the end of the day, the base is sticking with him, and I predict that he will prevail in 2020. Mika Mosbacher, we'll talk to you before then, I hope. Thank you very much for being on Hard Talk. <laughs>